I think you can find, maybe not beauty, but a good photograph almost anywhere. You just have to look. There are simple shapes of stars and, and circles and, and triangles and, and hexagons. And really, it, they all kind of moved around. It's kind of like a puzzle. They're moved around and suddenly you have this beautiful new design. I mean, I think it's fun to use what you have and, and create something brand new out of it. Bay Area Bountiful is about agriculture. It's about feeding us. It's about land and water. It's about the health of our planet. It's about stories that matter. Bay Area Bountiful. Cultivate. Celebrate. Connect. Bay Area Bountiful is made possible in part by Rocky the Free Range Chicken and Rosie the Original Organic Chicken. The Sonoma County Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District. Made Local Magazine and Sonoma County Go Local. And through the generous support of Sonoma Water. To make sense of the world, we often draw on our backgrounds and life experiences in order to translate our personal journeys into something expressive, a beautiful piece of art or an inventive craft. Makers illuminate and uplift through artistry and creativity, raising awareness and sharing unique experiences, qualities that are all inherently human. Pinatas are the familiar, colorful decorations used at festive occasions. <laughs> at one South Bay home studio, the traditional is taken to a new level by artist Patty Patello. I create piñata sculptures. So a piñata is created out of cardboard or paper mache and then it's beautifully decorated with paper. Most times you'll see them used for parties, so they'll fill them with goodies, candies, and then they're broken at events. I do create those to break, but I also create pieces to be kept as art. Patty has taken a cultural staple and transformed it into an art form all her own. I fell in love with making piñatas when I was really young. Piñatas, I know of them through Mexico. The woman who taught me <laughs> essentially how to make them even when I was just three years old um, was also from Mexico. They're used for festivities. She created these in her spare time. Because I was there with her while she was working, she'd let me stir the paste and let me attach paper, and so it was just so much fun. For birthday parties, they're usually cartoon figures or maybe it's a number and it has some sort of little decoration that ties into the theme of the party. But I also create some that are more sculptural work and that I've used at events, whether it was to exhibit my work in a gallery or for music events outdoors. They have a lot more detail and um, they might even be larger in size. Each piece is unique. If it has sort of a round shape, I'll begin with a balloon and then paper machine the balloon. I like to upcycle materials. I reuse cardboard boxes, cereal boxes, any kind of like thin cardboard is great for bending and molding into the shape that I need. I think it's important to, to reuse items instead of just throwing them away or recycling them to give them a new purpose just to get some of that stuff out of the landfill. I've also done a lot of robots in the past, and so the little knobs all get painted with, with acrylic paint. The pieces are put together with really strong contractor tape, and so that'll keep my piece together while I make the paste. Stuff that you have at home, it's water and flour. 
medium. And it gives you a nice thick paste, but definitely will give you a nice hard shell on your paper mache sculpture. Once I've paper mache them, I use two different types of crepe paper to cover the piñatas. So my studio, now because of the pandemic, uh, we've actually turned our a spare bedroom into slash studio and work office for my husband. So half the space is mine, half the space is his, and my artwork gives him, I think, a great background <laughs> for his meetings. Look at the lights, baby. You see the lights? She's so shy. <laughs> it's been really interesting also seeing my daughter kind of take an interest. Definitely wants to help anytime she sees me working. And I do post those videos as well because it's just, it's real. <laughs> it's real, it's what's happening at home. There's a project that I'm currently working on and it's made possible by a grant from Makla. Makla is a place where they have a gallery space. They host different sorts of classes, classes for the youth, classes for adults. It's a way to kind of bring the Latino community into these spaces where they can express themselves and, and be creative. So they decided to create this fellowship to help artists with their work and further their work. And I was chosen to be one of 10 fellows for this fellowship. And the project that I'm doing with them is actually focused on street vendors. I have these really fond memories of going to what is known as a frutero, or a man who sells fruit from a cart. Whenever I heard those bells, right, like you know what it is, you know it's a, if it's a bell, it's the ice cream guy, and if it's a honk, then it's the guy that has the chips and the corn and the mangoes. There are street vendors on just about every corner. And we would go and, and see him kind of do his magic. They're slicing all the fruit and packaging it up for you. And we would beg my dad to, to take us to these, these carts. Part of my project here now is, is thinking about that and those memories. And especially in the time that we are going through now with the pandemic, thinking about the connections with people and getting to know the people in our neighborhoods and kind of looking after them. And it's usually Latinos that are that are selling items. And so I wanted to to get the story from them and to see kind of what their hopes and dreams are for the future while they're here, if they plan to go back home. So I was able to get quite a few stories. As part of her fellowship, Patty leads workshops exploring her vendor cart concept. We're going to be creating mini paletero carts, or ice cream carts, and they're going to be created from cardboard pieces, little cardboard tubes, metal found objects like paper clips. I'll walk them through kind of how to build it. It'll have little ringing bells, and then they can decorate it any way that they'd like. Even if it's something simple as a little pineapple, they can see what kind of time it takes to create these pieces. He is so cute. So anytime I'm taking a, a photo of these pieces, it never fails. I'm like, Bruce, please move. I'm creating this life-size fruit cart. It'll have the fruit inside and the big, beautiful rainbow umbrella. It's fun, so the, the fruit that I've been creating now is it's all life-size as well to, to fit into the card and all the individual pieces are done one by one and then I'll install them into the main piece. Once you walk around and stand where the fruit vendor would stand, um, there'll actually be a scene in the back that'll show you a little bit about the vendor's hopes and dreams, maybe where they came from, but you'll be able to kind of stand where they stand and see what their life is like. A lot of vendors are coming from other countries, Latin American countries, and I'm hoping that with this project, people will, will take the time to kind of get to know people's stories. Sharing stories through art is a powerful way to create connection between people from different backgrounds.
In the North Bay, photojournalist Jeff Can Lee has been connecting communities through his work for decades. I don't think I can function as a human being without going out and working with a camera. Things aren't right if I don't do that. Okay, let's go. Finding the picture, clicking the shutter. I mean, I don't, I don't feel right unless I, I, I do that. It's something I have to do. I'm Jeff Can Lee. I started at the Press Democrat in 1968. I was there from 1968 to 2014. As a photojournalist, my role was to tell the truth. Yeah, you're there to tell the truth. I was probably about 12, and my uncle had an adjustable camera. So I had to kind of learn how to use it, use shutter speeds and f-stops and all that stuff. And my mother um, had a very rudimentary darkroom for doing contact prints. And she showed me how to do it. So I, I had a, 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 the laundry room I could use as a darkroom. And I just thought, oh, this is cool. And, you know, I started photographing for the, the high school yearbook. And, and I, I realized that you know, I was just using that uh, to learn photography. And by the time I got to UC, I loved photography so much, and I think I was addicted then, that I thought, okay, well, if I went to Daily Cal, I could work in their darkroom. I wouldn't have to share a darkroom with a ton of people who didn't know what they were doing. I, I think the photograph I do remember in my development was there was a during the free speech movement, there was a convocation at the Greek theater. Mario Savio got up on stage and the cops drug him off the stage. And I got a shot of that. I just thought, okay, that's as good as anything anybody else got. Maybe I should seriously think about doing this. And yeah, and I really have to thank Mario Savio and the free speech movement for steering me in, in the right career direction. Well, since I retired, I, I volunteer at La Voce, which is a, a bilingual English-Spanish newspaper. Right after I retired, I really missed working with people. And the publisher at La Voce, Annie Weaver, and I have had a running joke for years. She would say, after you retire, you're going to come to work for me. And I called her and said, OK, I'll work for you. I'll work. In fact, I'll do it free for you. I'm there to show the life of the people that live in the Latino community to people that haven't seen it and for the people that live in that community to see what their neighbors are doing. Day of the Dead. That's always a very fun, colorful thing to do. And there's, you know, an artist group that always seems to come up with something new every year. And it's always kind of fun just to see what they're up to. The kind of journalism I'm doing now is advocacy journalism. I'm just making their community a little bit more visible. I don't think that they've been adequately covered. You know, they're 28% of the population of Sonoma County, and I don't think they've had proper coverage. I'm shooting for me and the community, and I know that it has nothing to do with money. No paycheck involved. I designed it that way so that I would just do it for fun and for the community. I mean, that's why I'm doing it. 
Combining his skill as a photojournalist with a talent to connect with just about anyone, Jeff volunteers his time to document community events and meetings, and he brings this to the entire community. He has covered Cinco de Mayo, Day of the Dead, Pizzoli Night, art exhibits, graduations, La Cien, Harvest Festival, just to name a few. His work certainly has diversity and so much love and caring for this community. Jeff has changed lives with his camera. Many, many thanks, Jeff. The funny part about that is one of the things I, I did in the 70s was to photograph winners of that award. I never thought I would get one. I wasn't, you know, looking for any rewards like that, but boy, that was, to me, the ultimate reward for having fun. I think you can find, maybe not beauty, but a good photograph almost anywhere. You just have to look. If it catches your eye the first time you look at it and makes you slow down and look at it, yeah, I think it's a good photograph. To give you an idea, because I'm, I'm not as mobile as I used to be, I'll walk out and sit on the stoop of my house, and with a long lens, I will start photographing stuff that I'm seeing that might be flowers and might be insects that land. One of my artist friends says, are you really seeing this stuff sitting on the stoop? And I said, you've seen the pictures. You kind of have to look at wherever you're seated through the lens that you have on your camera. There's, that's, a lot of people don't look at it that way. But it's, it's fun just to, to find and see and record things that other people don't see, but it's there. just had a hell of a lot of fun <laughs> and it's not going to stop soon. San Francisco's Center for the Book is where multimedia artist Incia Dot can often be found working on her artist books. What is an artist book? You know, not everyone knows the definition or, or agrees on the definition, but artist books are beautiful, intricate. It's basically what the artist wants it to be. An exhibition inside the center displays sample artist books. has to have all the different components of content. Somebody wants to read it. It has the structure you've got to think about, the flow of the book. To make one book takes, takes a long time. Sometimes it takes months, sometimes it takes years. Incia's own books are especially time consuming to create with her unique focus on patterns. My projects have been very much related to geometric patterns, Islamic patterns, essentially. I was born in India. Patterns are everywhere in India. It's not just the mosque or the, the temples. It is on the homes. It's, um, you know, the windows there are decorated. It's, it's everywhere. So you grow up with, with that visual noise. This is what some people say here, visual noise. And so I've always been drawn towards making symmetry everywhere I go. Some of the richness is what I miss. So then I surround myself with that by recreating them in paper and in wood. So it's my way of kind of bringing that back with me and uh, helping it stay with me. The pattern 
Unseen book was there are habits that we all have. The underlying pattern that exists in all of us is always there. And so this book kind of goes through page by page of the pattern dismantling. I've used that as an analogy to show that we all have patterns unseen. And that's what the book is about. Illusions came out of this sense of everything around us is a sort of illusion of what it actually means. The Heart Longs book is about longing for something that has a bittersweet memory. The book is sort of an interleaving book. Incia's memory of difficulty seeing while wearing a traditional burqa inspired her design. The pages are covering the, the words, and that is to depict sort of that, that same restriction with the burqa, where you can't see. And so you have to see through the pattern in order to see the, the words behind. The books are made by hand. Literally, it's like I have all these sheets of paper. I have so much paper in my studio. You take the paper and then you're like, how do I take this design and translate it? Do I cut it? Do I draw on it? Do I paint on it? I sit on my computer. I literally take each of the pieces and then I mix and match and turn it around and mix the colors. Squares and circles and triangles. <laughs> It's like playing around with these constantly. And then I cut it out and then it becomes even more magical. And then you add depth to it. It just goes on and on from there. The cutting is done. Some of it I use uh, certain machines. Some of the cutting has to be done by hand because it's so intricate. It's like all these little pieces that get cut out. And the cutting happens, it's all over me. I go out, sometimes there's paper stuck all around me. My dog has probably right now some on the face. <laughs> You're like almost all through, but then some cuts you just mess up and it's not recoverable. So you're pretty much have to kind of throw it away, which you feel sad too, but you know, <laughs> that's part of the game. You're gluing it, you're folding it. There is no machine for that part. When it's time to bind pages together, many methods are possible. Stab binding is one. The binding has to appear on both sides. It's the same pattern. I first designed the Islamic pattern, and then I made the pattern of the binding exactly that. Incia's current project is also rooted in Indian culture. Henna dye is used to decorate hands before a wedding. I just recently had an idea about using henna, henna patterns. I know that I do want some henna hands in it. After being output from the computer, a three-dimensional polymer plate is made and prepared for printing. At San Francisco Center for the Book, now I'm trying the letterpress with the polymer plate. It has a nice deep impression. It has an old world feel. It has a sort of tactile feel to the book. I feel like the indentation is more realistic.
I know I want a poem that reflects the feeling of a bride. But at the same time, I want it to not just be about that one moment in life, but be a journey that arrange marriages and, and sort of what the implications of those are. Somebody told me that ideas are like butterflies that are flying all around you. And you can choose which ones to kind of look at and keep and which ones you let them fly away. And so I feel like I have all these butterflies all around me all the time and it's very exciting. That part is, is just it what keeps me going. <laughs>